everybody. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Dave Eisenberg. I am the founder and CEO of a 3D scanning and visualization company called Floored. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about big data uh, within the industry. Um, I'm going to be joined on this panel by uh, Eric Thorson, uh, who's joining us from Varric Media Management, um, software engineer by trade. Um, Eric has worked on uh, a variety of infrastructure around handling big data for digital media, but he's also been a uh, contributor to, um, to Rhino's BIM product, um, as well as uh, a number of simulation products as well. Um, on the structural engineering side, I'm joined by Greg Viltner, um, who's a structural engineer and is going to be talking a little bit about uh, true measurement within building performance. The, uh, the structure of this uh, topic is, or the tr structure of this panel is that uh, each person is going to chat for about 15 minutes. Um, uh, and then we're going to go into a Q&A session. So uh, I'm going to get us back on track. We'll, uh, we'll this, this panel will be about an hour long. Um, three 15-minute presentations, about 15 minutes for Q&A. And uh, I think we're going to start with Eric. Can we welcome Eric to the stage? Thank you. So my name is Eric Thorson. I'm VP of Engineering and Data at a company called Varric Media Management. Um, This doesn't seem to work. Can you guys just go to the next slide? So why am I here and what do I do? It's, um, you know, this is a conference about architects and engineering, and I'm here from a data company. So it's, uh, it's kind of a curious thing. So I'm going to discuss that for a little bit, some of the things I did in the past. Then we're going into a history of big data and what exactly uh, that was and how it kind of evolved. And then I'm going to discuss one of the core technologies that made big data a catchphrase these days and something that a lot of different uh, companies use. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit about what VMM does with this big data. So on, an advertising, uh, on the advertising side, how exactly we use it to uh, make advertising more efficient for our clients. Um, all right, can you go to the next one? So I went to school for architecture. I got a BA from the uh, University of Colorado, Environmental Design, a uh, Master's of Science from the IAC in Barcelona, and then a Professional Master's from Pratt. And that's actually where I met these guys from Gordon Thomas Study, where I met Yonatan and uh, Robert Otani. And um, I kept in touch with them over the last couple of years. So after I graduated, I worked with Rhino BIM for a while. I did a, uh, I actually wrote a real-time structural analysis plugin for Grasshopper. Uh, I kind of stopped developing it after I changed industries, but um, Rick Smith, who still runs RhinoBim, is still developing it, and he's still doing some work with it. I also wrote a uh, computational fluid dynamics program for Grasshopper that you guys can use. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Goldfish. It was um, kind of an experiment I did for a little bit, but uh, it got some decent you know, download rates at first. But those were uh, fairly... You know, they were very mathematically difficult projects, and they were very um, different from what I'm doing now. So I, I got a uh, offer at a couple, about a year after I graduated, to go work at a media company. And the president was brand new, and he wanted to start up an engineering team, and he asked me if I could develop their data management platform. So I was like, yeah, why not? It couldn't be harder than what I was doing with this stuff. And it turned out I was right. It wasn't nearly as hard, actually, as far as the... Uh, the mathematical side of it. From a data standpoint, it was much more difficult in kind of managing the, uh, the infrastructure and the way that, that that data is dealt with and the query times that we need to have. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, so this is what I do. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. If you go to a site like Home Depot and you're looking at a washing machine and then that washing machine follows you around the internet for the next three weeks, <laughs> that's basically what I do. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, um, that's actually a very difficult thing to do because we're tracking uh, the interests and the behavior of about um, 500 million people. And we have to do that efficiently and we have to be able to target those people efficiently and uh, the goal is to obviously maximize the um, return on investment for our clients. So let's go to the next slide. So what is big data? Um, this has been changing a lot over the last couple years, but it started off, uh, you know, where MySQL and some of those other databases that have been around for a long time were easily able to handle the data that was being produced by the, the users on the internet. As that kind of evolved, 
um, the big companies that you know now, like Google and Yahoo, had to come up with new ways to handle their, their big data. So if you go on the next one. Uh, so this is what Google gets. And this is, this. I got these statistics off the internet. They are from 2009. And <laughs> at that time, they were getting 800,000 requests per second. I actually talked to a company called AppNexus the other day, who's in the digital media space, who gets 25 million requests per second. So this number has increased quite a bit from 2009. Um, and this is what they were doing then. So 24 terabytes per day of data is what they were collecting. And that has to be searchable and indexed and able to be used by everybody in uh, the amount of time it takes for you to press enter on the, the search bar in Google and get a response back in a reasonable amount of time. And that's every day. So can we go on the next one? So this is how this kind of works. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys know about the world of digital advertising, but each ad is specific to the user. So in real time, a placement will come up on the web page that you're looking at. And in real time, it will go out to an exchange. And at that point, anybody can bid on this impression. So they know you. They know who you are from, from your statistics, from your cookies. And, um, <laughs> and they're able to place a bid to say how much you're worth to them, basically, at that point. So everybody bids on you. And those are the, the big names right there, the um, you know, Google, Yahoo, Facebook. These are the companies that do this. And that's kind of how you know, the internet stays free on their half or on uh, you know, how they make money and how they're able to provide this service. But at the same time, these are really, you know, you, can, you think of them as internet search companies, but in reality, they're advertising companies. So um, when you win an impression, it goes back to the browser, and your servers get access to that browser. So what that means is that uh, we're serving you a pixel. So a pixel is a one-by-one -one transparent image that goes on your page. And when your browser loads, you get access to that browser by loading that image from an external server. When that happens, we get access to all the parameters of your browser. So we can serve you a cookie, we can see your IP address, we can collect a whole bunch of information about you at that time. And we put all of that into a data storage facility. Let's go on to the next one. So with that cookie ID, um, we can link you across a whole bunch of different channels of digital media. We can link you on your social, on your Facebook page. We can link you on your phone, on your, uh, you know, on your actual laptop doing display and video. We can link you to digital radio using uh, Pandora. And we can obviously link you to search. Um, and through this, there's a whole bunch of information we can gather about everybody who kind of goes to these pages. Uh, so this is, you know, you can opt out of these cookies and things like this. And we, we set it up so that we give you this cookie ID and you're not allowed, or you are allowed to delete them whenever you want. With um, the NSA, for example, they do it a little bit differently. And, <laughs> and you can't delete what they put on your computer. But um, there is ways to do it. But, but basically, uh, you know, there's, this is kind of a young industry, and there's a lot of laws that haven't been written yet about this. But for now, this is basically what we can collect about you. So let's go on to the next one. So Varric Media Management, we receive a lot less than Google, obviously, but we receive about 5,000 requests per second, and uh, we get about, so far this year, we've, we've had about 51 billion requests and about 48 terabytes worth of data. Now, that's a lot for, you know, for typical computers. It's not huge compared to some of these other companies, but we have to be able to do analytics on that 48 terabytes and return results on that 48 terabytes and that 51 billion lines of, of data within about 30 seconds. So to do that, there's very specific um, hardware and infrastructures that we use to, to run this kind of analysis. And on the other side of that, actually, um, <laughs> depending on what you want to do with the data, it goes into a real-time database. And that is what um, actually determines the price as the user comes into the, to the ecosystem. Let's go on the next one. Should we go to the next one? So these are the technologies that we use. Uh, there's quite a few up there. There are um, a lot of Hadoop components. I'm going to discuss what Hadoop is in a second. But we use WebGL for our interface. We're making a lot of interactive graphics. And uh, we are providing different ways of looking at the data that's not necessarily the static charts and things that you typically see. We use C++ 
and Nginx for very, very high performance web servers. Uh, we can, on each computer, handle about 30,000 requests per second with our new configuration. With the one that we're currently running, we run with Tornado on top of Nginx. And uh, Nginx can handle about 10,000 concurrent connections, which is pretty good. And then we can run four backend Tornado servers on top of that to kind of handle all of that, that thorough put that comes through the thing. So our whole world is basically about just massive, massive volumes and being able to um, manage that kind of, that kind of flow. Uh, Scala is one of the, the things up there that I'd like to just touch on for a second, but Scala is a very cool new language. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's kind of an offshoot of Java and it's a functional language. So functional languages are written very differently than the typical procedural languages that you guys have probably seen more often. But um, Scala's a lot of fun. Uh, we use a lot of Rackspace and Amazon Web Services to handle our clusters. We have a couple different clusters that we use. Uh, and then we use R that was spoke about earlier. We use 3.js also, which isn't up there, but that was also talked about in the hackathon. Um, Redis is a pretty cool, cool technology, but you guys can you know, get a general idea that we use a lot of things. We test a lot of things to kind of figure out what's best for our, uh, our needs. So let's go to the next one. So the biggest technology up there and the one that made all the difference for the whole industry is Hadoop. And Hadoop is a, uh, it's a map reduce program. And well, it's evolved into something more, but it started out as a map reduce program. And what a map reduce program is, is basically a infrastructure or a, um, a set of tools to handle an infrastructure with a lot of different servers that run concurrently. So that is what allows us to get that, that data processing capability. And um, so that, that was developed by Google, by some guys at Google in 2004. And in 2005, Doug Cutting and uh, Mike Caffarella decided that they were going to take that away from, you know, out of paper form and make it a real product. And in, in 2005, it became part of uh, Yahoo's development efforts. And then it eventually went to the Apache Foundation and became a mainstream Apache program, um, along with the web server that some of you are familiar with. Um, and it be became, well, it's claimed that it became a, a industry standard in 2012. And that's kind of a statistic based on how many of these Fortune 500 companies are using it. So now uh, more than half of them are using it, you know, across their everyday kind of data crunching needs. Um, so let's go on to the next one. So this is how Hadoop kind of works. It's a massively parallel kind of architecture. Uh, so it starts off with a master, and <laughs> it's called master-slave relationships. And basically, you ask the master a question. And the master then distributes that question to all of the slaves that it's connected to. They, in turn, spin up a whole bunch of threads. And there's typically about one thread per processor for each of the computers. And uh, that talks to HDFS. And the HDFS is a distributed file system that sits underneath this whole thing. Basically, what it means is that it's one file system, or it acts as one file system, but it's shared. So each server that's being run has a little piece of that data on itself locally, so it can query its own local drives and say, what's my answer locally? And it can return that value back to the master. But when it does that, um, so let's go on to the next one. So when it does that, each slave comes up with a different, uh, a different answer to this thing. Each thread actually comes up with a different answer. So as they're returning their answers, the, the program needs to shuffle all of the answers back and forth and consolidate them into one concise kind of answer. So this whole process of you know going down this funnel and back up um, is what makes all of this kind of gigantic computation possible. A couple of years ago, it was uh, actually even a year ago, it took a long time to run these, these processes and Google would um, do huge aggregations overnight and um, you know, at, at lower times, at lower traffic times, and try to aggregate this data into more manageable kind of databases to be able to be accessed more efficiently. Um, so as it comes back, it comes back to the, ma to the master and then you, you end up with your answer. Let's go to the next one. So at VMM, we use these three data technologies as basically our, um, Basically, it's what drives our, our whole data practice for the most part. But Cloudera Impala is a very new program, just came out this year, and it's a massively, massively parallel architecture written in C++. It utilizes system resources amazingly, 
and it is very, very fast. You can put our whole data set in there, query that. Depending on what your query is, you can get an answer back in about 15 seconds from that, which is great. And that runs on, um, we run that over a bunch of different clusters. Our newest cluster is, um, it's about 20 servers. They are, and then there's two masters, but they run on dedicated hard, or they call it bare metal machines. And this is different than what you would get from Amazon. These are actual physical servers. And we noticed that the, the performance of them increases very, very rapidly as you move away from uh, sharing your computers with other people, which is basically what you're doing on virtualized cores. Um, so that one's written in C++, and that one is very, very fast. And Spark does all of our batch style queries, and that runs Scala. And we use that to do all of our kind of overnight processing to kind of tally up what happened that day, to get a good idea of who our users were, what the trends were in the market that day, how the prices looked, how they fluctuated, all that kind of stuff we aggregate using uh, Spark. And then Redis is our real-time data provider. As far as uh, we can query it with huge amounts of concurrency, we can query it with about 10,000 threads at one time, and it will return an answer flawlessly. It's, it's been really, really great for us. Um, it's an all-in-memory database. It works. Uh, it works great when you're really looking at a lot of different types of data across lots of different kind of data points and being able to pull that data in very, very quickly and get it into the actual uh, application server to kind of make the decisions for you. Um, all right, let's go on to the next one. So <laughs> this was a little thing that we did this year just to see how our uh, data processing skills were outside of media. And we just did a little competition with our clients to see how we would do as far as doing the NFL Pick'em League. And uh, during that, we ended up with a 69% um, success ratio as far as accurately picking winners of football games. And we, we did very well for that. So that was kind of an interesting, just little fun thing we did. We actually wrote that in R. But on a more serious note, let's go on to the next slide. Um, we mapped users. So this one, for example, is users who are interested in a certain type of, uh, <laughs> this one specifically was done for country music fans. And we went through and we tried to locate the, uh, the sites that country music fans go to. And then we mapped them throughout the country and we were able to see what other sites they go to. We were also able to see you know, what their typical income range is, how many kids they have, what kind of car they drive, um, things like that. <laughs> So what you see, though, is that it's kind of a funny result because a lot of these people don't only live in kind of the rural south or whatever, as you would imagine, but a lot of them live in parts of the northeast where it's kind of more isolated communities. And when you kind of think of country music, that's not necessarily what you think of. Let's go to the next one. So these are the sites they go to. Some of these are pretty funny. Um, one of them is romanticlyrics.com, for example. Um, a lot of them are sports sites, racing sites, hunting sites, things like this which are kind of indicative, but if you want to dig deeper into this list, it's interesting. Let's go on to the next one. Um, so after we actually have a campaign running and we have these, these clients and we're actually servicing them, we can go through and find out lots and lots of things about these people based on their web behavior and um, the other data that we're able to collect. So we can see how they use the internet, what they're interested in, who these people are, and then more efficiently how to target them. Let's go to the next one. So there's a... Uh, an animation of this bump really quickly. So you just refresh this. And if you could just zoom out and uh, just wait for a second, it takes a second to load. It just loaded a second ago when we tried it, but I was running this on my local local machine. Um, okay, well, I can just tell you what it does. It actually goes through and maps out where these people go in the US as far as travelers, and it is able to allow you to click on each individual traveler and see as they move around what sites they're actually going to. Um, so that's it, let's go to the next one. So that's the question. So the idea is how can we take uh, big data and this kind of idea of using this massively parallel architecture 
and this kind of ability to absorb tons and tons of data all at once, and how can we apply that to architecture? Is there an application for it somehow? Is there an application to engineering? Is there any way that we can use billions and billions of data points to, uh, to make architecture more efficient or to make the, um, you know, the process of developing it a little bit better? That's it. Uh, my name is Gregor. I used to work with TP for quite a while. Sit back and I have 15 minutes. All right, let's go. So um, I started out in design uh, with Sonten Tomasetti. I spent a few years at Skanska at a builder and uh, finally arrived at a, at, a, uh, at a startup called Energy Metrics here in New York where we deal with existing structures, buildings, and take performance data of buildings. So it's, it's getting away from the creative bits like step at a time and now there's hardly any creative things left. So. So Energy Metrics has a, a, a background in, in building management systems and uh, building automation systems. So all the BACnet and Modbus stuff, the things that decide when the air handler goes on and off. Uh, we've done a, a ton of stuff uh, integrating uh, SharePoint databases with, uh, with BIM models for facility management. We worked with data center customers. And ultimately, we've done a lot of uh, time series capture, storage, analytics, and visualization. So that's where the whole thing starts to be. It doesn't fit in SQL anymore. It's uh, like also a big Internet of Things. So let's, um, let's, let's do a quick, quick, quick one on the Internet of Things frenzy here and the smart workout. So let's say you're a, you're a fitness coach. You're a great running coach and you hit it out of the park. You have your own book, you have your, you have your web page, you have your video and you want to take it to the next level. So let's, let's see how this came about, right? So a long time ago, you use a watch and you measure distance on a map and you keep a spreadsheet. Next generation, you use a GPS watch. You hook it up with USB and you keep a spreadsheet. Then you use a GPS watch, hook it up with USB and you join runbuddy.com to basically map your stuff not on a spreadsheet anymore so that you can access it anywhere you want. And then Internet of Things happens, and all of a sudden your watch talks to your smartphone, which loads it up to the Internet, which is when the, in, when the data gets consumed by your, by your staff of running coaches in Australia that decide when to breathe, when to eat, when to do what kind of nutrition and feed it back to you in real time. That's just like fleet monitoring if you want. You have sensors, you have a gateway, you have the cloud, you have smart guys, and this thing is called a feedback loop. And that's what we don't have in buildings. That's what we keep talking about in, in design and architecture, but that's what we don't have with buildings. So generation what? Uh, you, you watch, uh, use your watch, you map it, and use a spreadsheet. That is basically residential buildings, right? Next, next generation around here, GPS watch, so you have sensors. You use a USB stick and you keep a spreadsheet. That is your, your, your typical commercial real estate with, uh, with a building management system. Um, then you do GPS, USB, and you join runbuddy.com. So this is when you decide that it's a good idea to join, uh, to join a benchmarking site, you know, like uh, Energy Star and these things. But you're basically not doing anything in real time with your building data. And then Generation 4 comes around with the Internet of Things, and there's quite a, quite a bunch of choices now with, uh, with Cyfri, with, uh, with Chariot, with TempoDB, a lot of time series databases in the cloud. But what's missing is, is the gateways. There's no, there's no, like no questions asked, little box that you can stick in your building and, and receive the data. And that's, that's where we, we've been quite, quite busy in, uh, in the last year developing. So let's do uh, equipment at a time before we head to uh, buildings. So we developed a fleet monitoring solution uh, for, for legacy equipment. So it's, it's you take not smart equipment like chillers, uh, generators, cooling units, crack units, and make them smart, and, and you do that for 50 bucks a pop using Raspberry Pi, for instance. So the point is your equipment sits in, in a data center, let's say, in, a, in, a, in an IP-based BACnet BMS system, and if you show up with some box and you tell them, like, oh, we're going to receive the data, and we're going to put it on the Internet, they'll just kick you out, right, because it doesn't work like that. So what we do instead, we, we hook up against equipment on a serial connection using Modbus, for instance. So this is a strictly local connection. We get it into a smart device, so this could be an Arduino or Raspberry Pi or something, and then we just we just push it out on the on the guest Wi-Fi. So that's called like network isolation, right? So you got to be on a different network if you want to get data out. Um, it goes up to a to web service and then eventually into some time series uh, storage system. The benefits of that is uh, you, you get visibility for the first time, kind of, right? You get visibility of performance, uptime, outages, maintenance issues. So this has been done for quite a while with, uh, 
with like wind generators, for instance, they have heat monitoring on those. Rolls Royce has done it with uh, aircraft engines for quite a while. Um, they probably know where that plane is. Um, so when it comes to performance and maintenance issues, uh, questions like how, right? So this is when you can start to, like it circles back to you creative guys, you can continuously benchmark data against, simula uh, against simulations and specs, right? And then you can start challenging because it's of course not gonna match up right away. So you can challenge the simulation, you can challenge the equipment, you can challenge your duct system and sensors. And that's all good because finally you're having a constructive dialogue. Currently we're not even talking, right? Nobody knows that, I mean, you, you have a lead building, it was gold five years ago, but you got no idea how it's operating right now. So once you have the data up somewhere centralized in the cloud, you can, you can dish it down into Excel, into web pages, you can do all this JavaScript and Angular stuff. You can, you can hook up a big simulation, you can MATLAB for that or any, any sort of different tools and drive little dashboards where you can basically say, this is my weather today, this is the temperature, this is the humidity, this is my IT load, this is what temperature I want in my hot aisle, and this is how my equipment should be performing. And if it doesn't, you can talk about it. What we observe, uh, observe with this kind of stuff is that there is, there's always multiple consumers of data. So a lot of systems try to lock you up. It's kind of like closed system end to end, but there's owners, vendors, operators, consultants, and they all, they all have different approaches to what to do with the data, right? Um, and, and then you take it from equipment level to systems and then it's, it's like it's, it's complicated stuff because you walk into a building and you look at the BMS system, they all do it differently. They have new different naming conventions, they have uh, different systems in different sort of nodes and equipments and, and the ease is, the, the, the ease of capture is very important. So you can't spend much time in the building because if you do then it, then it won't scale. Uh, network isolation is key. And then what, what we feel is very important is the ease of data access down the pipe and, and the ability to share your data. So this is where, where we kind of like cooked up EM Core. EM Core is a platform as a service. It runs an industry gate time series database. And it's basically an exchange style B2B offering where you trade building performance. So the idea is you have guys that have data and buildings. They're locally networked. They don't want to lock into a closed ecosystem. They're publishers of data if you want. Store in the middle and you facilitate an exchange to, to guys that know what to do with the data. Dashboards, compliance, you keep existing relationships in check and those are subscribers to data. So the idea is Internet of Things has, uh, that there's, there's quite a bunch of smart, smart uh, appliances now so they're not Windows servers anymore but they're uh, like little, little gadgets, they run, they, they run Linux and they, they talk Modbus and Backnet so you grab the data from the buildings through that and then you push it out, uh, you push it out into the internet. So the process for that on, in, in, in our system is, is actually fairly simple. Uh, you go to EM Core, you hook up, you get a, you get a, you get a user key, uh, you manage, you manage your, your boxes in your buildings, you get, a, you, get a, you get a key for the box, and then you, uh, you, you configure gateways on the box and then you just walk away and the data starts streaming. So it's fairly simple to get the data. And then, and then you, you hand it over to creative guys and they build dashboards, web pages, applications, analytics, all that stuff. So enabling that, right? Removing the barriers to upload and store the real-time data, receiving and keeping data in full resolution and facilitating exchange between multiple parties. That's, that's what we're trying to do. All right, now do it. I'm excited to show uh, all of you guys something that I, I hope you won't have seen before, which is what's really cutting edge in the fields of 3D digital capture and then consuming that information uh, through the web. Um, I'm going to be helped out with this presentation with our head of product, uh, Daniel, who's going to be here today. Uh, he's one of the experts on our team in computer graphics and in the, uh, the ease of use with a number of different frameworks with WebGL, um, 3.js, etc. Um, while they're getting it set up. Uh, so a little bit about Floored. Um, Floored is the company that I'm the, uh, the founder of. We, uh, we have about 45 employees. We got started in the middle of 2012, um, headquartered right here in New York City. We're actually around the corner in Soho. And, uh, and we're tackling two different but very related problems in how do we capture the digital world, the, the physical world around us digitally, uh, and then how do we visualize that world um, when we're working with spaces that don't yet exist. Um, a little bit about kind of how the company got started. I had a really once in a lifetime opportunity to actually sit inside of a venture capital firm, a really good venture capital firm in Excel Partners um, here in New York, and actually uh, take a year to think what do I, what do I want to work on for the next few decades. Uh, it's a position, uh, if you ever get a chance to take a, a role 
called an entrepreneur in residence. It's one of the coolest things you can do because you get all day long to, uh, to call people up and uh, use someone else's brand and ask them uh, ideas about the future. And so, uh, so I did this in 2012 um, and I started thinking a lot about what are the unsolved problems uh, in the software world. And um, one of the, the first slides that I'll show you is that uh, I started looking at the problem from the framework of people uh, places and things, and uh, a lot of the big wins in software in the past decade have been thinking about people, thinking about our ideas, our connections, uh, companies like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they're all a function of our ideas and our thoughts. Um, and then I started looking at things, because I had been a part of two successful um, e-commerce companies. I was thinking about what does the world look like when we're actually, uh, what does the future of our stuff look like? And I started getting really interested in 3D printing. Um, 3D printing as a, as, a, as a technology has been around for decades, but really as, a, as an exciting new field of inquiry, New York City has really taken uh, the front running role there above Silicon Valley where I lived for many years. Uh, MakerBot, Shapeways, a lot of the, the maker community is, is more vibrant here than it is on the West Coast. And so this was a potentially fertile area. Um, but across SketchUp, across 3D printing, across the, uh, the 3D modeling packages, I thought a lot of these problems have actually been solved. Uh, and so I started fixating on places, which is um, what would the world look like if we had this digital uh, equivalent, uh, this digital analog of, uh, of the real world? And this is where we decided to build Floored. So Floored um, is a company that deals in, uh, in a future where we're going to have a digital copy of, of what we uh, physically live in. Um, and I got really excited about 3D sensors towards the end of 2011, uh, partly because of Microsoft's work with the Kinect, uh, where they had gone on to sell tens of millions of these devices that actually were able to map a local 3D environment right in front of your TV. This is the thing that enables you to, to play video games without a controller. Um, and as these 3D sensors really started to proliferate, what you saw is that the cost of these sensors was dropping precipitously um, to the point where you now have 3D sensors uh, in fully f packaged products that cost low hundreds of dollars. Um, but I started looking at the enterprise 3D scanning solution, and, and what I saw a lot of was devices that look like that Faro device in the center, which for those of you who have been involved in, in 3D scanning or surveying, know that those devices start at around fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 and work their way up to about $150,000. And I said, well, why hasn't the 3D sensor drop, you know, uh, uh, drop in pricing affected the hardware that, that regular people can get access to? Um, and so we said it has. It's just that no one's actually put it together in one product. So we decided to build um, our notion of what an open source laser scanner would look like. Um, that's there on the left. Uh, total bill of materials costs about one-tenth of the cost with which you can purchase uh, a Faro uh, Focus. And so we're really excited about um, continuing this cost curve down such that uh, 3D scanning becomes something that's accessible to everybody. For those of you who track the 3D scanning ecosystem, you will have seen the exciting things that have happened with Apple buying PrimeSense, with Google's Tango initiative. Uh, these sensors are also coming to our phones in the next year or two. So I'm really excited about a world where we're going to have an absolute explosion of, of three-dimensional data about the physical world. And this really is where we've honed uh, our mission as a company. Um, our mission being um, to centralize and process that data. The challenge is that that data is actually super hard to work with. Um, if any of you have worked with point clouds, you've worked with uh, images, etc., you know that, um, that putting all this together in an automated fashion is a really challenging problem. Uh, the robotics industry has been tackling it for decades. Um, and so what we decided to do was, um, was leverage a lot of what was the best work in the open source uh, community, uh, particularly the academic community, and actually start to, um, to make this data a lot easier to work with. Um, we think about tackling the 3D problem in kind of an end-to-end -end pipeline where we make the content generation super easy and then we make the consumption of that data really easy. Um, what you're seeing here, I got permission to share last night actually, um, this is a 3D scan of Gracie Mansion, um, which Mayor Bloomberg was uh, able to invite us into uh, just a few days before we actually exited the office. The reason why is that uh, Mayor Bloomberg had meticulously restored uh, the Gracie Mansion over 12 years because he didn't live there. Uh, the new mayor was coming in and a lot of those changes were going to be changed. And so they were looking for a moment in time snapshot of what the Gracie Mansion would be like when it was restored to its original historic splendor. Um, all of the data that was captured there, talking a little bit about big data within the AEC world, uh, tens of millions of points, around 35 million points were captured, thousands and thousands of photographs. Um, and that data was aligned in about an hour and it was captured in about two hours. So just to get a sense for how far we've come in terms of making 3D scanning and alignment um, so much easier, um, that was done about six months ago uh, using our scanner and, and a guy from our team. So, um, so this is really uh, how we start to think about Floored is that um, this 3D data explosion is coming as a function of a lower cost 3D capture process. Um, our job is to make that data intelligent and easy to work with. 
um, and then to enable new applications that key off of that data. And it wasn't obvious to me when we started the company, but um, it turned out that the our killer application is actually in the world of commercial real estate, which I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, and so what we realized was that because commercial real estate often is in a position where they need to sell a space in a different condition than how that space is currently uh, showcased, there's a huge need to get a digital model um, for the purpose of, uh, of either showing it as is or showing it as it could be. Um, and in many cases, uh, commercial real estate is sold over the time period uh, or leased over the time period of weeks and months and years. And so the need for that real-time solution was actually relaxed uh, off of many of the problems in the robotics world where you have to know your environment around you immediately. We could leverage the benefit of the cloud to actually process and crunch that data, um, do some really interesting analysis to generate those three-dimensional models. Uh, and so we conceived of a business that would kind of work on two parts of the same problem. Um, the first is how do we capture the world around us? That's the 3D scanning component. Um, and then the other side of it is that we started getting a lot of queries about how can I showcase uh, a new building that's going up? How can I showcase a new floor that doesn't actually exist yet? Maybe we can leverage the 3D scan data, maybe we can't. Um, but we decided to build a 3D graphics function um, that was all about visualizing space uh, in a brand new way. And, uh, and I'll jump into that. Um, and in the process, we really conceived a business model that was around um, taking this static content that exists uh, for our customers who pay for black and white floor plans, they pay for someone to go in and measure a space by hand, they pay for someone to take crappy photographs of residential and commercial space, and sometimes now they pay for videos. Um, and we said, we actually can derive all of these things from a three-dimensional model um, using one process. Uh, and so uh, we're gonna jump into the demo now, um, but what we do is we use a 3D model uh, to capture the measurements and to generate the floor plans, to capture snapshots in time for the images for static marketing materials, and then we actually deliver a final solution um, through the browser. So let's show uh, the, uh, the first scan of the Louvre. Um, so what I wanna show is uh, what's possible um, with 3D scanning from an end-to-end -end automation program. We are actually able to get inside the Louvre six months ago as a, as a part of a research project with a PhD student. And uh, everything that you're seeing here is actually running directly in the browser. Um, this was our first implementation where we used a third-party graphics engine called Unity. Everything you'll see going forward is actually built in WebGL um, and is built in real time. But what you'll see here is that unlike a street view, um, this is actually a full three-dimensional model. It's textured by uh, really high-quality HDR images. Um, and in the process, we condense it into a low polygonal um, 3D model that someone can now explore through the web. Uh, as we enter this room, you'll see some really interesting uh, hybrid approaches where what you're looking at there are actually virtual cabinets with virtual models of real stuff that used to be in the Louvre in the 1850s. This was uh, part of an exhibition. It's actually online if anybody's a 19th century art historian. You can go to the industry website and you can actually tour this space. But, um, but what we did was we recreated what this room might have looked like in 1850s to be the visual counterpart of a dissertation that, um, that a woman at, uh, at NYU was conducting. That's how we got in and access to the space. But they were very kind to let us um, actually 3D scan the environment um, and provide these visualizations. Um, on the other side of the house, um, we also do 3D visualizations of buildings that don't exist. For those of you who've ever been part of the meatpacking district, um, this is a neighborhood, uh, this is a new building going up. Um, it's on a West 13th Street and meatpacking district. It's called 837 Washington. Um, and what you'll see here is that as a way to lease the space, um, we actually took a CAD plan, uh, elevated it into a 3D model, and delivered this through the browser. This requires no plug-in whatsoever. And this is actually how we're leasing space now in the future. Instead of having someone look at a set of renderings, um, you can instead deliver them a link. Um, you can give them different points of interest inside the space. So if they don't know how to navigate through a space, they can click from reception to balcony, et cetera, and it'll move them around. Um, for folks who are super not comfortable navigating through 3D, there's also a, uh, there's also a floor plan in the top right-hand side that's interactive. So you can click on a given point inside the, uh, the model and actually take you to exactly where you are. Um, and so we've made a, a concept, 3D navigation, which has been super challenging for folks who didn't grow up with video games. Um, and we actually said, this is, uh, this is how we can sell space in the future. We can show them exactly what the space is going to look like um, using real live furniture from Steelcase, Herman Miller, Noel, Noel et cetera, um, and deliver it in the browser with the real world views that are overlaid on top of that 3D model. And so we thought we had built this really cool solution about six months ago, and um, we started selling it to the industry, and we started getting a lot of feedback that, uh, that it wasn't real enough, that they had kind of uh, indexed against these beautiful, beautiful renderings that can be generated. And they said, uh, if you really want us to migrate our whole world from 2D to 3D, um, you've got to up your game in terms of the visual quality of, of those graphics. Um, and so what we decided to do was embark on a year-plus long project to build and conceive of our own graphics engine, all running in the browser in WebGL, that would feature 
feature the best in breed of physically based rendering uh, in real time. And so what you'll see here um, is that Daniel's gonna move us through the space. Uh, the lights will update um, in real time based on my actual position. Maybe you wanna zoom into one of those pieces of furniture just to show the level of detail. That's all been calculated. And this is all optimized and being delivered in the browser um, with, uh, with zero latency. Uh, these are materials that in some cases have actually been scanned in. In other cases, we've used 3D artists to actually model these different properties. And what we're doing now for the first time is exposing some tools and capabilities that enable people who are not really skilled at 3D modeling or manipulation to actually edit these scenes. So uh, if you wanna grab a piece of uh, furniture or maybe a light even, yeah. So there's a real-time lighting system inside of here. So as you click light and then look up, um, you'll, see, uh, you'll see that all of these lights, these digital lights, can actually be interacted with um, in real time. So um, if you walk a little closer to it and then play with maybe the intensity value or the decay value, all of these which are coming from actual IES properties, you'll see that it'll update in real time with zero rendering time. There's no latency. And so for our customers, this solves some huge pain points because they're used to waiting weeks, sometimes months even, for rendering turns to change. But we've built a system that lives in the browser where you can edit materials, lighting, furniture, uh, all keying off of this large and growing asset uh, library that we've built. Um, that enables people to uh, in manipulate with these objects uh, in real time. And in the process, we're putting 3D design, consumption, collaboration, um, and making it dynamic, making it social, um, and, uh, and making it really easy to use for people who haven't done it before. So uh, this is a preview of our new graphics engine. It's live with about maybe 10 or 20% of our customers. As you guys know, these, these uh, 3D graphics can be uh, difficult to run on older computers, and so we've been working on a sophisticated uh, playback system or fallback system that'll recognize the quality of the computer that you're on and then deliver you the appropriate 3D graphics for all of that. But you'll notice a lot of neat, fancy stuff in here, real-time reflections with chromatic surfaces, um, uh, uh, interactions between multiple different lights, global illumination, things like that. So, um, so this is the future of our graphics engine and many of the applications that will sit on top of it. Um, just to go back into the presentation, um, we're doing this in a somewhat novel way in that we're selling to customers who have never purchased these types of softwares before. So we're working with many of the largest developers uh, here in New York City and also um, around the country. Um, we are helping people lease and sell space um, a lot faster using 3D communication uh, for an industry that needs to or should communicate in 3D um, when in fact they're communicating in 2D today. Um, and, uh, and what I'm excited about as we build this business is that um, today we're kind of building uh, an application that helps people do a very specific thing, which is to lease and sell space faster. Um, but the second this 3D data actually exists, you notice that this ecosystem around the leasing activity starts to get really excited about the data. The architects and the designers want to use this as a tool to speed up their own visualization process, in the process throwing more margin to the, uh, the architecture firm, hopefully. Um, uh, for the furniture industry, they're super interested in selling their, uh, selling their products inside of a real-time engine to showcase what could stuff look like if I could highlight pr uh, products and swap them all out, what that might look like. Uh, all the way to consumers who, rather than going and looking at 10, 15 different office spaces on a rainy day like today, instead actually consuming this through their browser and walking through a number of different spaces. And so we see this as a data ecosystem that all sits around um, a new type of data, which is the open version of a three-dimensional representation of a space, whether that space has been scanned in or whether it's been uh, been visualized. So um, kind of uh, in conclusion, we're really excited that innovation in 3D is actually going faster uh, on, a, on a per year basis. Um, the data is becoming cheaper to generate as a function of the cost of the 3D scanners dropping. Um, uh, and the data is becoming richer as more different applications are built. Uh, and so tomorrow, you know, for the hackathon, I'd encourage you guys to think about what applications can be built that all live on top of this 3D data to bring more enthusiasm and more people around the fold um, for that information. Uh, and just to go in a little bit of detail about our hardware, for those of you who are curious, uh, it's inexpensive, it's modular, and it's designed to uh, produce really high quality data, both on the measurement side as well as on the photographic side. So I will say that for those of you who are interested in starting to do 3D scanning, we're gonna be slowly bringing people into the alpha in the, uh, in the summer. So uh, come find me or Daniel afterwards, and we can talk about getting these scanners into your firms' hands. Um, uh, you guys saw the editing data. There's a, there's a new skin that's coming on top of all of it. Uh, I'll send, let's play this for like 20 seconds or so. Um, but this is, uh, this is gonna enable product collection. So uh, if your firm has their own 3D asset library and wants to keep it in a silo, um, we're gonna make that possible. Uh, tools for more precision around working in 3D space, again, for folks who don't do this on a regular basis. Um, and then the ability to, uh, to mass instance multiple pieces of furniture, swap them out, et cetera. Again, everything designed to speed up the, uh, the process of doing design and iteration. 
Um, and finally, uh, we're super excited that um, all the data that we've built has been designed to work with, uh, with the Oculus Rift kind of from day one. This is a, a piece of hardware that if you haven't tried, I encourage you to come to our office, uh, play with the HD prototype, see what it's like. Um, this is going to usher in a new wave of computing uh, that we like to call, or they like to call, immersive computing. Um, it's about sitting inside of your designs, understanding them. Um, for those of you who, uh, who track the, uh, you know, the construction industry, um, we're doing this for the entire Hudson Yards um, development. Uh, for any of you who will be at ICSC, I'm on a flight to Las Vegas. Vegas, uh, fingers crossed tonight, um, and uh, and we'll be debuting this there. So uh, so we'd love for to show any of you guys that uh, if you're going to be there. Uh, if not, come and visit us in our office, and we'll debut it. But this is a really incredible piece of hardware. So uh, thank you. We're going to go into a live uh, Q and A now. So if I could invite the two other panelists um, back up, uh, we'll take some questions um, from the audience. Three different folks, three different types of background. Um, so lots of lots of different opportunities for questions. So my question is to Gregory. Um, would your service, let's say, replace a BMS consultant? I'm sorry? Would your, would your firm and service replace a BMS consultant, or would it basically augment it on top of a contracted BMS consultant's work? Uh, yes and no. I mean, yes. we continue to do like building automation work, mm -hmm. but we'd, we, we like to focus on, on, on grabbing data from, from existing buildings. Like um, I was going to ask. In, in that process for, let's say, um, purpose of uh, having a calibrated energy model, who would, who would determine the um, frequency of uh, data spits? Right? So, okay, there are the data loggers, but are they capturing data at every second or every 10 minutes or every day? So all, all those questions, and I know they are getting stored somewhere, and the, of course the, um, the volume of the storage will depend on how frequent you're taking the data, right? So. Those are those are like the things that come to my mind. They're not. Yes, I, I agree one hundred percent. Okay. Um, so we, I mean, we, we have the same. We have the same thing with BIM, right? Mm -hmm. We wonder. We build all these rich BIM models, and we take the data in it, and then it kind of goes to scan, scan the boys, and then it just disappears. I mean, no owner has their has their BIM models, or at least like very very few do. And I think that's that's the same. That's the same you're addressing with uh, with the BAS data. And then is it uh, is it the intention that that data keeps uh, being keeps like a logged in for like tens of years, or is it just gonna die out at? Yes, I like to call it a uh, dense fast forever. Mm -hmm. So dense as in insane numbers of points, fast as in like second intervals, minute intervals, and forever as in literally like. Uh, wha what's interesting if you go. The the low hanging fruits are. Uh, mechanical systems and chiller plants, right? Mm -hmm. And if you take pumps and stuff, and you can you can you can literally show performance curves as measured after one year, after two years, after three years, after five years. It's like you can see system fall apart in the data. And, and that, can, that can initiate maintenance. So the, the, the biggest opportunity is actually in, in long-term data. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. David, um, just kind of in the morning, I'm not sure, you, you were here in the morning too, right? You saw there were a lot of kind of designers, architects showing where we are currently at, I guess, in our industry in terms of designing new buildings. And I'm curious if you have thought about what, how those two will merge, the, the, the kind of technology that you're showing and the kind of you know, processes that we are dealing with. And then more, <laughs> kind of maybe a few years behi beyond that, it seems like you're starting to you know, develop a system that allows interior designers, or not non-interior designers, that allows my grandmother to redesign the, her living room you know, based on, I don't know, just kind of an open asset library of, of furniture, et cetera. Do you anticipate that based on these new tools, people will just, you know, develop and design their own spaces without the need of experts eventually? Well, yeah, I say uh, often design, we, we use as a benchmark, like whether our parents can use the software to figure out uh, how easy we've made it or not. Um, a lot of our customers, uh, you know, have the technical sophistication of, Grandma, and so we have to be uh, we have to be thoughtful in terms of uh, how easy we make it to use uh, we m we make our software to use. Um, here's what I would say: uh, it is very hard as a newcomer to this industry um, to work with the existing f tools kits and the existing frameworks. It's the software is often proprietary; it doesn't work interoperably. This has been a theme that we've talked about. Um, it is. Uh, 
it's expensive. Uh, it's downloaded. You know, a lot. It, it hasn't followed suit with many of the trends in, in sort of lean software development. And so, um, we're not starting there for sure. Uh, I think um, the truth is is that until 3D scanning becomes as low cost as the photography that we have in our phones and tablets, um, we will have to. Uh, and we're excited about having an enterprise relationship with the existing you know design and development industry. Um, but I don't think it's the first place we're going to start. We're going to work our way backwards from. Um, people that require uh, less liability in the in the uh, accuracy of the data and, and are looking more for um, looking more for frankly flashy quick wins in terms of their processes and in terms of their marketing uh, and then as we become a bigger company with more capabilities you'll see us move into the the harder parts of this industry and I think uh, we're having many of those conversations now I, I I'd encourage any of you who have ideas for us to come and talk to us you know we're mostly uh, it's mostly a, an engineering-oriented company. It's just it's a software engineering-oriented company, and so just keeping that in mind that we're new to a lot of the uh, the AC world. I think uh, we're very we're friendly people, and we're <laughs> and we're open to hearing your ideas and solutions. I guess this question is also for David. Uh, I just started working with some 3D point cloud data uh, that was released lidar data for like entire counties. So it has like all the buildings, watersheds, trees, roads, all that kind of stuff. Is it possible to build models? It's very low density, but it has, I mean, you can tell where all the buildings are. Is it possible to build a model that can be shown in the browser like you had in the museum? And I'm just imagining an application where, you know, you have FAR values and you could click and it would dynamically change how that scene is rendered. Is that something that, would be p even possible. Uh, so, so if is it, is it possible? Absolutely. I think you you have to make cons uh, constraints to the the application at some point in time, right? It's going to be uh, the size of the mesh that you choose to generate. It's going to be whether that mesh has to be generated automatically or whether you're willing to have uh, a human step in the interim. I think we've taken the the point of view that. Um, Pure automation is actually not necessary to bring a commercially viable product uh, to market, but in fact, smart tools is really uh, one way to approach this problem, and that's that's been our approach. And so, to answer your question, you know, I think it's a function of the tools that are built to extract the data that you need from the data that you have. Um, I will say that we're not set up to scan everything. You know, we're not trying to boil the ocean in that regards. But I think um, we'd love to. I'd love to chat with you about. Um, some of the tools that we're building for reconstructing interior spaces, uh, just about how those might be repurposed to uh, to reconstruct exterior spaces and then to uh, to build towards the end that you're looking for. Um, for the last piece of it on, on actually appending data to the 3D data once it's in the browser, that, that's one of the easier problems, just whether it's annotation or whether it's metadata that's associated with it. Come find Daniel or me afterwards and we'll, we'll share our approach there. Great, thanks. Uh, David, my question is also for you. Um, can I download any of these models that are up on this tool that you're using? I mean, w I guess the focus of the conversation has been around making these tools available online and in the browser, which I think is really important. But I'm also wondering how accessible is the information that you guys are providing? Do we have to pay for these 3D models if we want to, let's say, um, download them and, and make a little uh, first person shooter or something, you know, like if we wanted to just plug it into Unity and just walk around these spaces ourselves um, and not be, not have to conform to your platform. Yep. Um, the second part of that question is, I was wondering, you mentioned that the hardware is open source, um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, um, how we'd be able to access it or buy it or is it like a part kit that we can get online with a connect or yeah great great questions um so the answer to the first question is maybe uh and it um it depends largely on on who our customer is in that part of the the value chain we have customers that absolutely want to grab the point clouds and bring them into their own environment and, and we're not here to say no to that um and then there's uh people who actually don't care about how the data is generated they just want the end application for those folks uh less clear that the downloading is is part of what we offer from a from a sales perspective um to answer your second question, uh, in general, I will say our bias is towards open data, and so we are uh, we're more inclined to give you access to it. Um, we're hoping that you're using certain modeling tools in the practice in the in the in the process, but I'll uh, we can talk about that offline. Um, on the second uh, the second question, um, which I'm now starting to slowly forget as I'm talking. Um, uh, second, okay, so um, let me clarify what. 
What we've done uh, with our hardware approach is we've used off-the-shelf hardware as opposed to proprietary hardware from a fabrication standpoint. So um, in some cases, you'll have more root access to those different pieces uh, over than others. Um, we've just tried to come up with a design that's modular as opposed to one that uh, you can't hack. And so um, we're in the process of devising our strategy for how much of the uh, the code that connects those different pieces is going to be fully open versus partially open. And so um, I'd love to hear what your ideas are for it, and then, and then we'll chat about it. You ended your topic with uh, how can this big data be used for um, for the AEC world? Um, we know that buildings generate a lot of data. Um, can you think a little bit about who else or what else is going to generate the big data for this industry that could be crunched using the frameworks that you've described? So I've thought about this a little bit, and I've had, well actually I've thought about this quite a lot. I've had uh, conversations with people about this, and it's hard to find something in this field that generates that much data. For, m for the internet, it's a user by user basis, and not only that, but it's actually them clicking on things and loading pages. So every time you load a page, you collect a data point. So it would have to be something that's more um, user specific. So something like the internet of things, that, that that topic keeps coming up, would be, something that this could be applied to. Um, in advanced materials, I suppose, I mean, I don't know the, the uh, you know, based on the cost of this, it may not be a realistic thing, but if you were to in embed lots and lots of sensors into uh, you know, pieces of concrete, into um, bridges at every single joint and things like that, you could actually start to calculate the average stresses and strains that happen on each one of those joints on a second by second basis and calculate when the uh, probability of the joint failing would be highest or in what time period it would be highest. You could calculate things like the internal structure of, uh, of concrete and how certain kind of vibrations or displacements would happen that would cause additional stress on the material. Um, aside from that, I was uh, talking with somebody that was discussing the possibility of using it for assessing the return on investment for real estate. So taking into account every single um, person, basically, that lives in a neighborhood and their interests and their behaviors and starting to understand how um, different restaurants or stores that went into that neighborhood would have potential for success. Let me put a question to the audience. So someone has to volunteer to answer this. Um, we often run into resistance to adopt new technology from the real estate industry, from the architecture industry. Um, curious uh, as to whether someone from the audience is, is interested in uh, commenting on um, who's not receptive to the idea of using big data. I think we've, we've seen a few different examples of big data and, and would love to hear um, what, you, what you're finding are the problems or the blockers to actually getting adoption here, I think, uh, both in terms of the actual tools and technologies, but also just the concepts of using, uh, using large amounts of data to inform decisions. Um, I think that's an interesting uh, discussion topic for the group. Since it, I'm at the mic, I'll turn that right around Thank for you. Gregor. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question was for Gregor, and it's the, the title is Calling the Bluff. Have you actually had the opportunity to embed sensors in a building and disprove uh, some of the analysis results that were going on during the design phase? And if not, what's keeping you from doing that? Well, we, we didn't actually disprove any of the analysis from the design phase because <coughs> that wasn't available to us. I mean, you have buildings that are like around five, ten years, so that's all in a cellar somewhere in a shelf. I mean, you can't just pick that up. It's uh, not available, that data, I think, in, in most cases. And I think you, the answer to your question is it's really tiring because we've been doing BIM for such a long time, and it's still a minority in our industry. Uh, it's culture. Like, you go to any engineering firm, and there is so many guys that do engineering and so few guys that do BIM and it's the same in architecture and, it's the and so then it gets worse as you go into construction. Like you try to grab data from buildings, it's, uh, it's th the guys that, that, that are, s well, the guys that have access to the data aren't incentivized to perform better. Like nobody gets a bonus because the building operates 20% cheaper. Everybody gets fired as the light goes up. Um, and uh, so, so there's culture in the way of of doing that, and I think uh, 
I, I disagree uh, with what you said about instrumenting bridges. I mean, that technology is absolutely available, and I don't think it has anything to do with, with the kind of big data you're talking about. I think it's just culture and a way of actually doing that. Well it's like that tracking that stupid flight that fell in the water. I mean, that's totally possible, too. That sort of gets at my question. You said it's really hard to get the data out because there's no incentive. I wonder if there's um, sort of a more guerrilla approach. I know we have one hackathon project tomorrow that's going to look at building some really simple sensors to measure comfort. And if instead of trying to partner with owners, if we went into libraries, institutional buildings, and just sort of hid these things under tables and started collecting data, if you could actually start, s start to generate some useful, useful yeah, data. Yeah, 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 Cooper. Uh, the universities actually, like like collecting data from campuses, incentivizing students to to playfully engage with energy data, has been uh, it's been really successful. And I think the more use cases we generate using using those forward thinking clients, uh, the well, the, the, the easier we will tackle that culture barrier of engaging with, uh, with with other places where it's a little more difficult right now. sort of doing that, well, you know, you're not an architect, and you're, you're moving into that space, and it's completely, you know, open source. Um, architecture and engineers will be taking advantage of that. Selling services into that. Um, it's, it's blue ocean, as uh, I think one of you said uh, earlier today. Uh, they take advantage of fees and, 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 and revenue that could be uh, there from anybody. So it's, it's, it's a matter of an industry that's really blinded by our history and not thinking about what, it, what we could do with um, skills and information and repackaging the best way to do that. So I like to think sort of a different way from what I've, you know, I've just been doing with my career, taking advantage of doing things differently and not just doing it based on how I was taught in school. Uh, David, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned one of the challenges was making point cloud data easier to work with. I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about how your technology does that, like object recognition or any other Sure. So for us, um, we're focused on the real-time alignment of point clouds. Uh, so while you're in the field, um, with a user interface that is simple enough for someone who's not an expert to actually be able to perform the 3D scanning. Um, the speed of alignment, the registration of great, great textures to those point clouds, those are some of the problems that we've tackled. And then we're setting out to do something a little bit disconnected from, I think, what most of the AEC community is looking for from point clouds, which is to go directly into BIM. We're trying to go into this non-BIM visualization that solves for leasing and marketing problems. And so our toolkit has a lot more to do with how do I go from the field to a simplified representation of that space uh, with awesome focus on the visuals. If there's one area where I think the 3D scanning industry has not spent a ton of time on, it's on visual quality uh, as opposed to measurement quality. It's also one of the reasons why we're able to drop the cost of the 3D scanning apparatus by so much is that so much of what you're paying for in the incremental cost is actually in precision around the measurement side of it. And so. Um, I don't mean to actually throw the existing 3D scanning industry under the bus. It's just that we've identified a different opportunity for a different piece of hardware that I think will, in the process, drive costs down, which is really what's needed, I think, is just overall cost reduction in the, in the production of point clouds. David, um, yeah. how does your tool differ from Structure Sensor? And what uh, protocols are you going to? You're referring to the sensor by Occipital? No, structure sensor that uh, was started on Kickstarter and yeah, incorporated PrimeSense. Yeah, okay. So uh, they're made by, it's made by a company called Occipital. Um, so 
mobile 3D scanning is a fundamentally different problem in our estimation than, uh, than tripod-based 3D scanning. Uh, because so much of our customers are, are commercial real estate and, and we're scanning spaces that are five to 500,000 square feet, you know, you need a longer range uh, device. And so we've used LiDAR for that as opposed to an infrared approach. Um, we've also decided that the textures that you get off of mobile-based devices are not up to par with what we need. So uh, different tool for different purpose, but uh, you know, big fans of 3D scanning in general. Did you uh, Gregor, did you want to append to the last question? No, I wanted I wanted to comment. Uh, I, I actually uh, yeah, I, got, I actually looked at your your stuff yesterday, and I was literally floored. It's it's so cool. <laughs> um, what what we've done is uh, so so we, we we had this BIM model, right? All out BIM, structural, architectural, mechanical, of a of a really big like Walmart size data center, right? There's a lot of stuff in it. And we hooked it up with a with material database and equipment database and documents and it all lived with Navisworks and and we gave it to the facility management team and I don't see that they've used it yet because they don't have a computer that can actually open the file and uh, they don't have a person that is that is uh, fearless enough to to do it. Whereas I think uh, where I would love to see your stuff is is a, is a lightweight augmented addition to what we do with BIM to give to to owners. Like to go in a place, do your stuff, and then and then on a, on a piece by piece kind of like wherever you need to do work, add a little bit kind of as you go. So I, I think this is really cool stuff. You want a break? Okay. Um, everybody can listen to Yonat. <laughs> so there's going to be a, a hackathon project tomorrow. They will try and get uh, Revit and, and Rhino and other programs to just uh, stream l right to the to the web browser. So kind of doing what you just talked about. And speaking of hackathon, we have these neat little um, tents, I think they're called. Uh, so everybody, <laughs> so this is like the ID identity tag for everybody who will be here tomorrow. Um, let's just pick them up now from the front desk so that you know for the rest of the day we can start talking, forming teams, et cetera, et cetera. It'll be easier to kind of understand who's, who's participating. You're gonna be there tomorrow, right? No, okay. Um, your colleague will be there, Daniel. Yeah. Daniel, yeah. And then Gregor's colleague, Maxime, will be there as well. So we'll have, we'll have some really good people. So we'll have about 20 minutes break now until the next talk.